Hello everybody and welcome to another dash daringly exciting storm, storm, or a barnstorm inversion of Radio Rama where I show you how to work on radios and radio based electronics, stereos, record players, some televisions, and uh, other stuff that tends to work on glowing vacuum tubes from the 1920s through about the 1960s. And this is going to be a little bit of a different episode. I've had a few people that I think are a little bit newer to the channel and they asked could I do an episode where we kind of show how to restore a radio for the folks that maybe are, are new to the hobby and would just kind of like to learn some of the basics and I'm going to try I actually have tried this several times and I fail every time I do it because I wind up just forgetting everything that I should inform you about because to me I've done so many of these it just feels like going on automatic mode and I will forget to describe what I'm doing and um, I think um, if you're, you know, if you're just starting out, I was there myself, maybe about 15, 20 years ago. It can be confusing the first time you do it, but I assure you, once you get a few of these under your belt, um, it'll all start making sense. So I chose what I think is the perfect starter radio. It's a very typical All-American 5 set. Um, they made these by the millions and millions. And once you've worked on one AA5, which is their nickname, you've worked on them all. <clears throat> this is a 1947 Emerson, and it has, of course, as noted, five tubes. And their voltages are as follows, 35, 50, 12, 12, 12. Now, why did I bring that up? It's because if you add up all those voltages... What do you get? You get about 110 volts. And <clears throat> this chassis design was very popular and um, successful because one of the most expensive parts of a radio back in the day was if it had a power transformer, which is a pretty complicated piece of machinery. It would take AC in and then distribute all of the different separate voltages throughout the set. And this doesn't have a power transformer. Instead, this works like an old set of Christmas lights. And I'm um, not sure if some of you are old enough to uh, remember this, but you used to get Christmas lights that would come like all on one line. And maybe the Christmas lights were 6 volts. In fact, I've got a few of these old lights. Those are old 6-volt Christmas lights, or 12 volts or whatever it was. But when you strung them all together... Um, that would essentially use up the 110 volts, if that makes sense. Same deal with these, these, um, transformerless radios. Put all the filaments together in a string and you can run 110 volts through them. Fine. Um, there are, as I mentioned, two different distinct type of chassis. There's ones with the transformer and then there's one without a transformer, which is what this is. And then there are two different types of this chassis, or this chassis type. There is something called a true hot chassis set. I'm not sure if that's the official word. Hot chassis, I guess, rather. But that's a generic term that they seem to apply to this set, which I believe is what the other type of hot chassis set is, which is a floating chassis. And the distinction there is a true hot chassis set would have one end of the incoming plug power this uh, you know one side of this plug is going to be directly soldered or attached to the metal chassis and that's kind of dangerous because that means if you were to touch that and ground at the same time you would get everything coming out of the plug going through your body and that could be very painful even fatal um, early on a lot of the manufacturers realized well how can we mitigate that risk and there's two ways of doing it. One way is to physically isolate the chassis from the user in all possible means uh, necessary. 
that means that the mounting hardware, the knobs, the back, everything is completely physically isolated. The user cannot touch the chassis unless they were to take the chassis out of the case. The other way of mitigating that risk is to put a capacitor between the chassis and one end of the AC plug. And what that does is that reduces the amount of current potential, meaning like how much volume of electricity could get to you from the chassis because that capacitor is knocking it down. And so, again, AA5s, All-American 5s, very common. You can find these by the bucket loads at flea markets still to this day. All right, so let's get started on the electrical restoration. And what we're going to do here is give it a test. And what? let's talk about safety first. First of all, if you're not comfortable working on something like this, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you shouldn't do it. Um, I, you know, there, there is a potential here for you to get shocked. And so if you really don't feel like you know what you're doing or you, you don't understand, like I, I don't recommend you, you do that, but it's up to you. Anyway, let's talk about safety a little bit. So you should not just, you know, test these guys out. I know on my, my station, I break my own rules, like literally every, every episode, but you should bring it up slowly on something called a variac. And all that means is we start from zero and we can work our way up to 120. If you're on the other side of the ocean, 220, whatever. And we're going to run this through something called a isolation transformer. I have a commercial grade one here that's kind of overkill. Uh, but what this does is this ensures that I add that extra layer of safety because it's going to want to favor the ground going through that outlet versus true ground here, meaning less shock hazard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in isolation transformer. It's already on, it looks like. And we'll bring up the Variac. I'm going to start at about 50 because Usually nothing happens, but I'm hearing a very loud hum. So I'm not going to power this up anymore. Um, usually what would happen is you'd bring it up and nothing would happen until you got all the way up to 120. And then it would hum like crazy. And that means that the electrolytic capacitors are shot. And by the way, we're going to get into talking about capacitors in just a minute. All right, before we go too much further, I'm going to just talk just a little bit about tools. If you're serious about this hobby and you want to you know, get into it, go ahead and get some decent quality stuff. As far as me, I use this as uh, my primary multimeter, uh, Fluke 115. It's not the fanciest one, but it does pretty much everything I need to do. Uh, I don't think they're that spendy. That's probably about 125 30 bucks. I think I don't know. I've had it forever. Hand tools, it's also worth investing some decent money in them. My personal favorites are tools made by Exolite and Klein. They just seem to last forever and ever. These are my wire strippers. These are my little nippers for my leads. And then my sharp needle nose pliers I use for twisting things and pinching things together. As far as soldering irons go, it's not a fair comparison because I got a pretty expensive one. This is a Metcal soldering station. Um, I find that anything made by Weller, their Weller adjustable stations is pretty good. And here's some of my other tools. Lots of little screwdrivers and more nippers. A couple of generic no-name tools in here. Once you get in the rhythm and you get your tools all sorted out, they almost become like additional appendages and they'll start to feel natural. Let's move back to the chassis. And let's talk about capacitors, because that's mostly what you're going to be doing when you work on these, is replacing capacitors. And there are two different kinds. There are electrolytic capacitors, and then capacitors that are named a, different, a bunch of different ways. It's either paper caps, or plain old... I'm not sure. I'm, I'm at a loss for word, but anyway... Two different types of caps and the capacitors that tend to cause the most issues in these 99 percent of the time are these big guys these are the electrolytic capacitors 
this is a can that has multiple I need to back up for a minute when I say the word can that usually means the capacitor the electrolytic capacitor we also call the some of these guys up here the IF and RF which is the internal frequency and radio frequency uh, transformers we call those cans too getting ahead of myself like I said this is more difficult than you would think so when you hear a radio hum and colloquially known as motor voting that refers to when the electrolytic capacitors also known as the filter capacitors have essentially dried out because all the film that is wound up inside of this thing essentially uh, the dielectric material has fused together and is no longer preventing the sound of nasty AC, which is alternating current, getting through into the set's audio. So we need to replace this guy first. And the other major difference is that electrolytic capacitors have a polarity. They have a positive and a negative, and these guys do not. Now, if you don't know how to read a schematic, which is common amongst a lot of people who are beginning, don't fret it. It's not the end of the world. And the reason is because 99% of the time the parts that are in the set will be marked with the values that you will need to observe in order to replace them. So for example, this has these markings MFD and WV. That means microfarad working voltage. So this reads a 0 .002 microfarad capacitor rated at 600 working volts. Probably doesn't work at that high of a voltage, but they had to anticipate if there is, you know, the surge when you turn a set on, which can be many magnitudes higher than the, uh, the, the current that it'll, well, the amount of current it'll be working on and voltage it'll be working on after it warms up. So they have to put a kind of a buffer area in that voltage rating. These right, this um, capacitor is probably original to the set and we're going to cut it out of there and take a look at its values and I'll show you what you need to do in order to replace those. Alright, so I've pulled the mounting clamp off of this electrolytic capacitor and we can see that it's got color-coded wiring sticking out of the back of it. That's important. We have a red and these colors fade with age. What does it say here? Red, green, and black. Red is 30 microfarads, MFD. Green is 50 microfarads, rated on 150 working volts. So by process of elimination, you can tell that used to be green. It looks more like yellow. Black is pretty obvious. It's over here. And here is what we're going to do to replace these capacitors. So there's two inside of that and you can see that bubbling up ooze there. That means that cap is definitely shorted. It was a good thing we didn't bring it up all the way on the Variac. So what we're going to do is replace the two electrolytic capacitors inside of that with two individual one of these. These are 47 microfarad rated electrolytic capacitors rated at 160 volts. And the new ones, you see this stripe here? That is the negative. That means by default the other side is positive. Now, when it comes to electrolytics, there are two basic rules, which is if you observe the capacitance and voltage, your capacitance, which is your microfarad, needs to be at, which is at least 30 microfarads or greater, meaning it can be more than that. Now, don't go nuts. Like, don't put a, I don't know, 100 microfarad cap in for a 30 or whatever because what that'll do that'll just stress out one of your tubes which is this guy the rectifier so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the 30 microfarad and the 50 microfarad with a set of 47 microfarad capacitors again you've got a little margin of error so 47 versus 50 not a big deal and the other thing that I need to stress, which is also very important, is to look for the capacitor that goes 
to the chassis ground because that's your grounding cap that what's it makes this essentially a floating chassis ground and I looked around and I could tell very easily which one it was is this guy I don't know what its value is because it's all covered up in tape but it's not the right kind of capacitor nor is it the right value and what do I mean by that so back then I don't think they truly understood what it takes to cause a heart to fib fibrillate which means if it were to cause the electrical impulses in your heart to throw things off could potentially throw things off and you could have a heart murmur worst case scenario you could have I don't know it could paralyze your heart so they put in way bigger values than would be acceptable today meaning as much as I've seen some with five tenths of a microfarad all the way up you know usually down to 0.047 rated microfarads and that will not pass by today's standards so what we're going to do is replace that with a different type of capacitor with a different capacitance and different voltage ratings and that is referred to as a X2 Y2 cross the line capacitor rated at 0 0.01 microfarads that will go to chassis ground that will reduce the current potential even greater from getting to the end user. We can also see we've got a capacitor down here. I mean, sometimes capacitors look really bad, but this one looks like it has shorted. The wax is spewing out of the ends. That and this failure is probably why this was buzzing, even on low voltage. Welcome to day two of doing the basic recap job of this, this Emerson radio. And looking at it again, there's a few other things I've noticed. It looks like it's been worked on in the past. This resistor's been replaced. That capacitor's been replaced. That This black thing, those are called black beauties. That's probably from the 50s, 60s maybe. So now I'm going to talk about how I go about replacing these multi-section electrolytic capacitors with the two aforementioned individual electrolytic capacitors and this is when you start needing this is when you sometimes have to be a little bit creative because if you can see here this wiring is just running all over the place there's not a lot of room to put things here so what I always do is I just look for a convenient place to mount possibly both of the capacitors if I can help it and it looks like we have the common black wire here that's the negative of the original electrolytic and that is going to this point here. The two electrolytics inside of this share that negative lead. So, and if I look at it, we've got quite a bit of room here. It's a pretty steady mount right there. It's not really wiggling that much. If we put these two negatives together, we twist the negatives together, and then we have the two positive ends sticking up, what we can do is reroute the two leads here, this red and formerly green wire to the individual positives of the electrolytics that will be sticking out here. Before I do that though, this cord is not acceptable. If you get a cord here that when you bend it, it stays bent like that. It doesn't really have a lot of flexibility. That means the plasticizers that are in it have dried out. And even though it's fine, sort of okay now, eventually it is going to disintegrate and crack. And this is going to go out into the wild to some future owner. And let's imagine they keep using it right up for another 20, 30 years. This cord is going to only get worse. And it's not great now. Might as well replace it. And in the meantime, we can cut it out of here to give ourselves a little more room. Looks like it goes here. And... There. And let's cut that. Now we have a lot more room to work. So we can replace this capacitor. And of course these two guys. A little smished up. Shorted out one here. And um, I'm going to get some new wiring that we can run to the two positives of the electrolytics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount this into a holder. This phone and I will try to go through this methodically and uh, do it in such a way where hopefully it'll make sense to some of you newer guys. Alright, so let's go ahead and get started here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two electrolytic capacitors here 
I'm going to bend their positive leads up. And then I'm going to twist their negatives together like so. I'm going to trim a little bit of this excess here. And then, like I said, I was looking for a common positive place to mount it. Let's cut a little bit of that, that old negative wire out of there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of wet that point here so we can just add a little bit more of a base of solder to bed these electrolytic capacitors into. In fact, I'm looking here, and I feel like actually they might be better if they were mounted here. This is even more stable, this, this area here. I'm using my Metcal soldering station wand. I think I mentioned it before, they are kind of pricey. But if you do this every day like me, it's well worth it. Then I'm going to apply a little solder. Well, actually quite a bit of solder to our negatives of our conjoined electrolytics. And then you just want to tack it in there initially. Like so. Hold it until it is steady. I'm going to make sure it's in there real good, so I'm going to add a little more solder. And once that cools down, that should be just about right. Yep. So now we have our two positive leads of our electrolytics sticking up. And what I've done is I've already pre-cut some lengths of wire. And um, you want to kind of approximate the length that you need to, to, to get to the new capacitors. Obviously, I made that one way too long. I don't advise that you want to keep your leads as short as you can. It's not good to have stuff just floating around willy-nilly. So we're going to run that through. And let's see, where does that go? Let me get this out of here. I'm going to attach that down at the base of the pin that the green, former green wire of the old electrolytic attaches to. And you want to make sure and really get your solder good and molten. A lot of people, you know, when they start out, their solder joints are way too cold. It's called a cold solder joint, literally. And since we don't need this old lead anymore, cut that out of there. And now we have, let's pull this black lead out of there too. Now we only have this red lead. And again, we have an approximately measured wire. It's not, it's not a bad idea to make them a little bit longer than you think you need. Cut that guy out. I have to admit this is not the most pleasant chassis. And we want to cinch that up around this pin and solder that into place. Let's see, did that take? Yes, I think it did. All right, so that one will run to this positive of this electrolytic, and the other one is going to come around this way, and it's way too long. So we'll cut that to length, and I'll take out my wire strippers and strip the ends. And what I do is I usually tend to make a little loop. There's actually a tool called a pigtailer that'll make a nice little loop for you, but I'm so used to doing it this way. That's just how I do it. You make a little loop and you crimp it. Easier said than done. Take my glasses off so I can see what I'm doing better. And we'll solder that into place. Alright, and then what we want to do is trim our excess 
lead. We want to keep our lead dress nice and short. And we'll take our other one, do the same thing. We're going to make a little loop in the end, like so. And then we'll come around and crimp for that one. And we'll solder that one into place. And we'll trim its excess. So now we've got both electrolytics replaced, and now it's time to replace a few of the paper caps that are suspicious, and then we'll bring it up and see if it works. Okay, so now that we've got the electrolytics replaced, it's time to replace some of these other troublesome capacitors. I could not tell what the squished up one was without removing one of its leads. It says it's actually a .0005 microfarad rated cap. I had to dig around in my supplies. I happen to have a little ceramic one. Uh, these ceramic disc capacitors, if you see these in a set, leave them alone. They're usually just fine. So we're going to replace that one first. Looks like that goes to the last pin of whatever this tube is. And since it's so tiny, we can hide it in a little place. So again, I'm going to get my pliers, make a nice little loop like that. Hoping my hands aren't getting in the way of this. We put one lead around that connection there. Again, we want to really get the solder really good and hot. And where does this other where's this other side go? Why it goes over here. Let's take a look at this guy. Oh wow, you can see the entire center. Like that that center should not be hollow like that. That means that this is completely melted. So that one's that one's literally literally fried. It's probably what was giving us our nasty noise when we tried to fire it up earlier. And where does the other side go? Oh where, oh where does it go? It goes, looks like over here. I think what I'm going to do, when you've got leads that kind of are a little loosey-goosey like that, sometimes what I'll try to do is um, put a little bit of sleeve around it so it's not going to touch anything. My cheap and dirty way of doing that is to strip some wire insulation. Great. Just drop one of my capacitors and we can put that over the end of this lead that's going to be going over the top of the tube here. And again we'll trim it down as quick as short as we can to do the job. Then that will come over here and connect to this lead and we will solder that in place perfect push that lead down a little bit I'm going to replace the grounding cap when you see this loop going around a cap like that I find that most of the time it does not make a hill of beans it doesn't make one bit of difference as far as the performance. So we're going to cut both ends of this cap out. And we'll need to go to chassis ground. Will that reach? Maybe. If I stretch this out a little bit. Yeah, that'll work. So we're going to cut the remainder of that wire off of there. Again, we'll make a little bit of a loop-de-loop -loop with our wire. around the old wire, solder it into place. Of course the smoke is coming up and hitting the camera, that's lovely. Let's trim the excess and then we'll run that over to the lead going to chassis ground. Oh, come on. Quit being hateful. Uh, all right, we'll bend it around there. And we'll solder that 
into position. Now I'm going to replace one more because it's kind of sticky outy and I don't really like that. Before we do our test, and it says, again, if you look on the, the sides of the capacitors, you'll see the value. This says 0 0.05 microfarads rated at 400 volt, volts, working volts. And what I do when I replace capacitors, I replace one end, uh, one at a time. It looks like this is going way down in here. Huh, that, that wire was actually coming loose. Sometimes you can use old bits of insulation if it's in decent enough shape, which I think this is. Maybe just turn a little bit more. And again, where does that go? Can't believe this. That appears to be a factory cap too. It's just not really soldered there. It's not really soldered in there. That could have been the cause of the initial failure of the other cap. When you create that much extra resistance in a circuit like that. All right. So what we're going to do this time is I'm going to wet and melt the solder. This lug here, and then we will attach one end of the replacement capacitor there, and that just came right off along with the insulation, so that was kind of embarrassing. Let's try that again. In fact, let's use different insulation. All right, let's try this again. Maybe we'll put a little more solder on that mounting location. This way it's something to sink into. All right, so now we will try to attach this again. There we go. And let's see where this goes here. Why that goes over this this is you can tell they were still not used to working with miniature tubes. Everything is very tight in this this chassis. And we don't need that much of this lead here. We can keep that nice and tight. Oops, still too long. Usually I don't put insulation on these guys, but since this is so tight, I'd rather there not be the potential of anything touching. Shit. This came off. Well, maybe I don't maybe I don't need that insulation. This is so close here. Let me get that out of there. Alright. It's probably not the best radio to display this. Everything is so squished in here. All right, let's solder that in. Come on now. There we are. So we've got the caps, enough of the caps replaced so we can at least give it a test fire, but I need to put a new cord in it first. All right, so I replaced a cord. That was a little painful because I had to use one of these I'm not sure what they're called, but you need a special tool to install them, which I don't have, so you have to kind of wrestle to get them in. But we should be able to at least test this guy now. I've got it turned on. I've got my isolation transformer connected. I've got my variac up here. Let's go ahead and bring it up slowly. We'll start it at 50%. And it appears that maybe my pilot light is burned out. Down here, that should be lighting. Okay, so let's bring it up. I don't hear anything. That's a good sign. It was buzzing when we first started. I'm going to bring it up about 60 or 70%. It looks like that I'm starting to see filament on one of the tubes. I believe that is the output tube. Let's turn this up a little bit more. 
All right, so we're at 60%. Nothing's blowing up. Bring it up to 80%. This is when you might actually start hearing something. But so far I'm not hearing anything. Since nothing's happening at 80, I'm going to go ahead and bring it up the rest of the way. Looks to me like we've got a red plating tube here. Either that or I've got the tube in the wrong socket. That's a very real possibility. All right, time out. Let's see what's going on here. All right, well, I took the output, I mean, the yeah, the output tube out, and you see this kind of whitish looking stuff. That means the tube is partially gone to air. So that's no good. So. I don't know if any of these are good. I'm going to stick a replacement in there. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to replace the pilot lamp. These usually use something called a number 47. Of course, I'm trying to do this one handed. Well, I'm failing at this episode. All right, let me replace that and then we will bring it up again and see if we have any more life. Okay, let's try this again. Whoa. Something's definitely going afoul here. Unless I just put the wrong pilot lamp in there. I'll have to double check that. Usually when you see that, that means your rectifier is probably shorted. So let me get another rectifier tube, 35W4. All right, so this is a good uh, lesson here. It shows that even someone like me who should knows what they're doing can make stupid mistakes. When I was looking at the, uh, the tube layout, for some reason I got the, these two guys messed up. The rectifier, which is the 35W4, is actually supposed to go in the back. I had it in the front. I had these two tubes swapped. But even when I tried it again, um, we've got an issue, which is the pilot light start. Well, let me let me indicate that. Let me show this, even though I might blow up the pilot light, but it's worth it just to make a point here. So, ordinarily, I'm up to 50% now, and you see that pilot light's barely on. Now, if you watch. What's going to happen is when it gradually gets to a point of getting warmed up, it's going to start getting really, really bright. And then if you let it go, it'll continue, it'll blow. You see this? I'm turning it off because I know it's going to blow. That almost always means that you've got a shorted capacitor somewhere in there. And I'm looking here, and you see this guy? It's a coupling cap coming off of the output tube and you can see the end here is coming completely off which means it's blown the ends when you see something like that that means the cap is most definitely most likely shorted now unfortunately I can't continue this uh, much longer this evening I have to go pick up my parents at the airport which is an hour away um, but we will resume with this tomorrow Hopefully this is making some sense to some of you guys, especially you newbies who I've made this episode for. Um, but we'll resume this tomorrow, and hopefully we'll get all of the little bugs worked out. That's the fun sometimes of working on these guys. You just kind of have to figure out what their issue is, just like if they're a patient. All right, see you guys tomorrow. All right, I was just kind of kidding. I looked at the uh, estimated time to get to the airport, and since it's going to be 10 o'clock at night there's no traffic so just because i was like i cannot stand not knowing that this is the problem here i'm going to snip this old guy out oh yeah you see that same deal it's completely hollowed out so this guy basically cooked itself what value is that 0.02 microfarads and here we go. Here's a nice new shiny capacitor. We will replace that with what? What pin is that coming off of? Oh, by the way, 
When I say pins, what I'm referring to is when you turn a tube upside down and you count basically clockwise, on a miniature pin you start with the gap. This is pin number one, two, three, four, and so on. So I'm looking down here and pin number one is where this cap was coming from. So we will put a little bit of insulating sleevery on it. I'm not sure if that's really a word. And we will again make our little loop here and attach it. Make, make things a little bit easier on me. Cut this excess off of there. Just cinch it up there. And we'll solder one end of the capacitor here. Let's see, did that take? I think it did. One way to find out. Yep, it's on there good. And while you're, if you ever drop little pieces of wire down in your chassis, get it out of there because you'll forget about it later. But then, in, you know, with your, with my luck, what'll happen is it'll short out on something else. And we'll put our sleeving on the other end. I'll snip this. It's interesting because one end of this goes to that other capacitor that I took out that was also shorted up. So there must have been, I wonder if the set got struck by lightning. Something definitely catastrophic happened here to cause it to have that kind of spectacular failure. Who knows? All right, so we got that all cinched up there. And let's solder that guy in. You know, since there's been so many capacitors in here that have failed, I'm going to check the other one that's in here. The, this, this guy has like no voltage on it. That goes to the volume pot. I'm not too concerned about that. All right, let's hit myself in the face. All right, how's this other one look? And what does it go to? Looks fine, but just the way it just because it looks fine doesn't mean it is fine. But I'm gonna take my chances. It's got a splinter. Now we're gonna know right away whether or not this fixed the problem. We're gonna look at the behavior of the pilot light now to see what it does. And we have our power turned off. Set turned on. That is still behaving very funny. I'm not sure if we fixed the problem here. I think we might actually still have a shorted capacitor in there somewhere. I'm ready to turn this off in a split second if I have to. Bah! Something's still shorted in there. That, either, that means one of several things. Either again, we have a shorted, shorted capacitor somewhere. There's not many left in here too short. That black capacitor could be shorted. That's going from pins number two to I don't have my tube data. I don't have my tube manual up here to look. But I'm just looking around to see if there's anything that could cause the kind of pain that we're seeing here. And not Really, it's interesting that there's a few resistors that have been replaced in here. This guy, that guy, that guy have all been replaced. And what does this go to? That goes to that guy, I believe, is the across the line cap. That could that wouldn't necessarily cause the issue we're seeing. Let me see what my time is. It is. Still got time. So what I'm going to do is replace that capacitor and this capacitor and 
I'm going to double check. To, here's the other thing. Like, there were a few tubes that were loose in this guy. I wouldn't put it past the possibility that one or more of these tubes could potentially be in the wrong sockets. That too could cause the issue that we're seeing. I'm going to do some investigation. All right, well, I replaced the rest of the capacitors. I didn't do jack shit. Now I really got to go to the airport. Um, I think what I'm going to do is tomorrow I'm going to do some more diagnostics. I'm going to check tube locations, see if they're in the proper places. Uh, and then we're going to test the tubes, see if we've got any gassy or shorted tubes, which could also cause a problem. Uh, I'm going to see if there's any miswiring. I'm going to check my, uh, we're going to do some basic diagnostics when it comes to things like measuring B+, which is the DC uh, voltages coming off the electrolytics. We'll get into all that good stuff tomorrow, but i got to hit the road. See you guys tomorrow. All right, welcome back to the next day of working on the Emerson Model 518. And I decided to confirm if I had correct tubes in the correct sockets. <clears throat> and this is, again, another chance for me to indicate that even I, I say even, especially I am prone to making idiotic mistakes. And... Um, the most common miniature output tube in an AA5 is called a 50C5, but there's another one less commonly used called a 50B5. And I, just glancing at the, the schematic, I just assumed for some idiotic reason, oh yeah, it's 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 got to be a 50C5. Actually, it's a 50B5, which has a completely different pinout. So I was probably torturing the crap out of this thing. So we're going to plug it in again. Now, did you see that? That pilot lamp kind of flashed and then gradually faded back down. And probably what's going to happen is when it fully warms up, it'll make itself go up to full brightness. It's not a guarantee. I'm ready to pull the plug if I have to do that. But I think we're... Well... Seem like we're doing more better. Here, he does not get credit for time. Jesus, that's loud. All right, so here's another thing that happens a lot with these sets: is sometimes the pins and the sockets can get dirty. So what I need to do next is um, I'm going to pull this back off here, and then I'm going to take this outside and uh, use a brush to remove the dust and then we're going to clean all the the sockets and the tube pins so this again is what the set looks like now that we're fully recapped actually i, I take that back we're not fully recapped yet we have one last capacitor that goes to the center of the volume control which is this guy uh, these are also if, if someone says oh the volume pot that refers to the volume potentiometer. That's what that is. And it has three lugs. One on the either end, on either side of the pot, and then there's a center. So let's take this back off. We'll take it out to the driveway over here and we'll dust it off. All right, this next step you don't have to do, but I do it anyway. Take the set outside and uh, kind of do a little bit of a dusting. I use an old paintbrush just get in there and get all the loose shit off of there now I need to say something that's important um, if you ever get across one of these chassis and you see green corrosion you probably should not take it out and dust it instead I would advise that you take a damp cloth and wipe it down because what that is is cadmium corrosion this appears, I'm not sure if it has cadmium or not, but it's not really corroding and it's not really flaking, so we're okay. The next thing I'm going to do is take this in and we're going to straighten up and clean the pins and clean the tube sockets and then we're going to do a test fire and see if radio functionality has been restored. All right, so what I've been doing here is not only cleaning the tubes, because why not, but I've also been cleaning and straightening the pins and uh, they literally have something called a tube pin straightener. I have it mounted here. Stick your pin, not your pin, your tube in there and it straightens the pins. And then we're going to clean the tube socket. I'm just going to put a little 
cleaner in there. And then we'll put that tube back in there. Now hopefully that's going to restore radio operation. So let's go ahead. Actually, before I do that, let me put the uh, back back on. And I'm going to clean the volume control and then we'll test it. All right, now we're going to clean the uh, volume pot potentiometer. And you'll notice that where these three legs come out, there's a little gap up here. Not sure if you can see that. That's where you squirt your juice in there to clean out the uh, surfaces. Whoa, that was a lot. But anyway, <laughs> you want to work that in. The shaft itself feels a little rough, so we're going to oil it with a little triflow penetrating lubricant. That's already starting to feel a lot better. Still grabbing a little bit. That's kind of interesting. Could be the switch, too. Let's try and get some juice in the switch itself. Ah! Alright, I need to drain that excess out of there. Now, what we're also going to do is oil the tuning condenser bearings. There's some here. And you want to get the back bearing surface. That's already turning a lot better. Alright, so now it's time to try it out again. There we go again. We see that the pilot light just kind of got bright for just a second before it calmed down again. I don't want it, my ears get blasted off by the volume this time, so I've got my hand on the volume control at the ready. What a thing to live 119 years. I live... It's kind of a sensitive little radio. Now we notice here we got a little tear in the speaker. It's not the end of the world can patch that. A lot of people make a mistake of putting like hard, you know, glue that dries to a hard surface. You want to use something that's gooey that stays flexible. I use this product a lot. It's called Lexel. Sticks just about anything together. In fact, I've got pieces of my truck held together with this stuff. It's great. So we'll do that. And then we'll go to the next stage of the electronic restoration, which is to do a safety test. We're going to see how much current is really getting to that chassis. All right, so here's the kind of the final stage of doing the general radio restoration before we get into the next step. And that is to make sure that the uh, amount of current that's getting to this chassis is below the threshold we have set, which is basically six tenths of a volt. We put this on the two volt my wife's carvings. Isn't it nice? We're looking at little carved horses' asses. But anyway, um, two volts AC on the multimeter. I have a box where I can reverse the polarity. And we're going to touch the chassis. That's reading at 0.446. So that's two tenths of a volt under our maximum threshold. That means it passes just fine. That's exactly what we want. And uh, let's make sure, I just patched the speaker as well. All right, we are firing on all cylinders. The radio is doing well. The last thing that we're going to do, now, before I continue, if all you wanted to do was have a restored AM radio, 
These are the steps that you would follow. You can put this back in the case and call it a day. You don't need to do anything else. But uh, there's some things that we've been doing lately at our museum to help make these guys a little more useful to the future owners. Um, there's not a lot to listen to on AM around here, and I get a feeling that's a good part of the case in most of the rest of the country. That is, unless you like angry little talk radio shows and religious stuff and sports. But if you don't like that kind of thing and you want to listen to music, then you can um, add that ability. We're going to add a feature that I call the audio input feature, where we're going to use the sets amplification section of the chassis to run audio through that part of the chassis and uh, then we're going to add the ability to be able to switch the radio signal on and off so that we have a, the potential to play clean audio or listen to the radio. The user will have that choice. Okay so now let's do the last thing that we're going to do electrically to the set and again I'm going to try to explain this in a way that makes sense. So the volume control, or volume pot, or potentiometer has three legs. There's a top, there's and a bottom, and then there's a center. The top of the pot, which is this side, is your positive. That's where the signal comes in from the radio that gets basically, well, basically gets controlled by the volume. The loudness gets controlled. <clears throat> And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, especially if you're new to this hobby. What you want to look to indicate or identify is which side is the grounding side of the pot and the top, which is the positive side. You don't need to worry about the center on this one. This one's not so bad. What you start doing is you trace where the leads go. And where does this go? why it goes to the negative of the two electrolytics. So you know just by looking at that, well, that's your negative. That means our process of elimination, there's only one other choice, that this is where the radio signal's coming in and getting adjusted. And if we trace this wire, it's going down to the bottom of this transformer. That is the last transformer that delivers the signal, the radio signal, to the, the volume pot. So there's two things we need to do. First of all, we need to make sure that the signal that's coming in that gets to the user is sufficiently electrically isolated. That means that if someone were to touch the end of the audio input device and they were touching ground, they wouldn't feel anything, not even a tingle. That's kind of important. The other thing we need to do is make it to where we can cut the radio signal entirely. Now this one's gonna be a little bit tricky because sometimes you'll just have one lead and that controls everything, but we have several things going on here. We have this lead and then this resistor going to this, basically this coil that's going to the other RF coil. So there could potentially be some leakage coming in from here, so we might need to actually detach both of these. And what I'm saying is we need to make this able to be switched on and off. And what we'll do is we'll put a little skinny wire and that'll go from one end and the other two will have, well, the other lead will have the radio signal lead or leads. Now, this is what we call an isolation transformer. And even though the name sounds fancy, all this really is, it's the same thing as if you were to crack open a wall wart, you know, those things that you plug in to charge your phones or whatever. And this is, this is a wall wart transformer. It's the same, same deal. So one of these is the, the incoming AC, which is 120 volts. It's this one that's the primary. The secondary puts out 12 volts. So we're reducing that current significantly. Here, we have the same thing. This is the primary side. This is 120 volts going in. This is 12 volts going out. What we're going to do here is the primary side is going to go to the volume pot. And the secondary side will have an incoming audio signal. And because we have a stereo cable and it has a right and left channel, and we want to capture everything that's possibly catchable with mono, because you don't want to lose a channel, 
we're going to tie the channels together but you just don't want to tie them to together and leave it like that you want to run it through a set of resistors and it's pretty loosey-goosey here anywhere from 75 to 100 ohms is fine we're going to put the right channel here the left channel there or vice versa twist these two ends together solder them and they will go to one side of the secondary side of the transformer the other side is ground which is the ground ring off of that cable the other side the side that goes to the top of the volume control these sets from this era you know forward and back just a little bit have something called an automatic gain control feature we found over the years that these transformers can interfere with the radio signal and that system so to essentially put a shunt between the transformer and the top we're going to add a little capacitor and again this is pretty loosey-goosey anywhere from 0.02 to 0.05 somewhere around there and then a resistor that goes in series with it that is half the value of the volume pot in this case it's 270,000 270k whichever and we have a little switch here the switch is what's going to run off the switch wire to switch the radio signal on and off and here is our three leads coming off of the cable. We have our green, red, which is a right and left, and black, which is our ground. And what we're going to do is we want to install that transformer as close as we possibly can to the volume pot on a flat surface. This will do just fine. We're going to clean that surface with some rubbing alcohol, roughen it up a little bit, roughen up this, apply it with some super glue, and uh, I'll show you what that setup looks like when it's all assembled. I tend to find it's easier to construct the um, isolation transformer assembly outside the chassis, so that's what I've been doing lately. So here we'll have the right and left channel come in as a set of resistors, and then on the other side we have our um, in-series cap and resistor, and then the other side is the ground, and that's going to go right there and we'll snip the wires to fit. What I tend to use is I think Gorilla Super Glue Gel works really well and of course I didn't open it before I started filming. You just want to put a little bit on there. A little bit as I put a lot. And we're going to get it as close as we can to the volume pot. I'm going to stretch these wires out a little bit. There we go, and then just press down hard and hold, usually for about 10 seconds or so. And it's stuck. It's on there real good. Again, you need to make sure and clean it up. Clean the surfaces really good and roughen them up. And um, it seems to bond pretty quickly. Meanwhile, I have my audio cable coming through. It's going through this hole that was already in the cabinet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for my glue gun to get real nice and hot and I will glue it in place on the outside and inside so no one can like yank it out. I tied a knot in it, but I want to make sure that no one's going to yank and chafe the cord. I'm just basically encapsulating it. This, I need to trim. It's a little bit too long. That will go to these two resistors. And after that, I'm going to snip this wire and we'll do a test to see if um, our radio signal is switched there and that um, the audio is going through sufficiently. All right, so it's all installed now. We have our isolation transformer, our two resistors with our right and left channels going through and our leads attached to the top and bottom of the volume pot. I found that I needed to remove both that resistor and this line coming to that IF transformer. I have a little, excuse me, portable rechargeable Bluetooth device here. And that's running through the set. Anyway, I've got no radio. The signal's completely cut. We're going to tie these two together. Run the switch out of a little hole here. See if that switch still works. And then it'll be time to do cleaning of the cabinet and reassembly. All right, now for the fun part. We've gotten the electronics done. And now it's time to work on the case. Besides, the reason that people collect these guys is for how they look. And uh, this material, at first I thought it was Bakelite. It could very well be, but it's got this very strange modeled pattern. I thought someone 
had painted it. Regardless, I think it could be Bakelite or a, or a hybrid Bakelite material. On Bakelite, it's very important not to clean it. And what I mean by that, I mean if it's absolutely filthy, you can maybe use like very, very light soap, but I'd, I'd try not to use soap or water. Instead, what you want to use is a cleaner wax. I use a natural car noob, a cleaner wax. This one's already pretty clean. And we're just going to buff it out. I use old rags, uh, like an old sock or something like that. And you just want to go over it kind of really in a circular pattern. Sometimes I'll take three or four or five passes. Originally, these kind of looked like a mirror, one that came from the factory. This is not going to be that difficult. Sometimes it takes a long time to bring back the shine. Um, but the finish on these is quite delicate. The, uh, the shine comes from the casting that it came from the mold. And a lot of people are tempted to take these in, in the sink and just scrub the crap out of them. You'll remove the casting, you'll never get that shine back. So just be, be mindful of that. All right, well that took probably about an hour. And uh, let's put it out in the sun here. And kind of see, we get some of that fine detail that was missing before we return that gloss. This is about probably what it would have looked like from the factory. All right, so it's time to put the chassis back together again, maybe clean the knobs and we'll call this one done. All right, it's all finally put back together again. The knobs that came with it were just put on there by the previous person's decoration. They did not fit, so I had to find some other knobs that did. Um, I might dig around in the museum tomorrow, see if there's something that looks even better. These do okay. Anyway, I've got my Bluetooth running through. We'll tell on you when tears come down. And we have our little switch in the back here, so if you want to listen to the radio, just turn that on. And we get ready. I'm seeing the reverence. Anyway. As always, thanks so much for watching. I hope that you newbies got something out of this. And by all means, ask some questions down below. All right, until the next time a radio comes across my workbench, see you next time. Adios.